So, I'm going to apologise now, because this is going to be a one-shotter. I, I have one shot to get this right. Exactly one shot. So it's if not Pearl Harbor, and this is the recorded video. And I have one shot because... Eh, um, for those who have not been watching my videos and don't know it, my mum's been my mum's currently in hospital, and I have to reconfigure the house so she could sleep downstairs if she wants if she comes back um, before the physical uh, before the um, occupational therapist come around to make their assessment, and um, I'm also going to visit her and spend some time with her this afternoon in hospital. And believe it or not, I can't record these videos in hospital. They don't like me standing in the middle of a particular the particular ward, which I'm not allowed to say, because she doesn't want to. You, she's not in there for the uh, for the name of the ward, but uh, she's in there because of the level of care they can provide. And um, yeah, it's fun. It's fun. So, if not Pearl Harbor, well, this is always an interesting point to start discussing because. It, it kind of makes the point of why they picked Pearl Harbor, but also makes the kind of point of other people's analysis of trying to think that Pearl Harbor was safe and secure. Pearl Harbor is such a valuable and useful target for the Japanese that they're going to go to an extra effort to try and get there. If they're going to go to an extra effort to try and get it, then surely it behoves you to go to some extra effort to defend it and to think through that more properly, to think it through more capably. A good example is the fact that if Pearl Harbor is such a vital base to attack, then surely there should be no circumstances in which you remove the any of the commanders that are ba uh, commanders of that the fleets and forces based there ability to receive all the intelligence information that's vital for them to do their job. If you do, then you're undermining the security, and surely, therefore, anything that happens out thereafter should rest with you for removing them from that distribution list. Oh, and that is the whole plank of defence for Admiral Kimmel, and frankly, it's a very, very strong defence, because you can hardly blame a person for preparing against what they presume to be their likely threat if they're not receiving information which would directly contradict that as being the likely threat. It's also the fact that, you know, your decision, entire decision for removing them from that was... Uh, list was to try and stop them using that information like previous admirals in the post had to try and claim that the defences of Pearl Harbor were not up to standard and that they weren't didn't have enough fuel, enough infrastructure there to support the fleet you were putting there. In Kimball's defence, even without that information, he was still making those claims, which kind of tells you how much of an issue there is. And also explains why Nimitz spends so much time, uh, part of the first part of his tenure, actually reorganising the infrastructure and logistics of the Pacific Fleet. And of the Pacific forces. And actually, that is a major part of the effort to build up. So, whilst they're, yes, they're rebuilding ships and all these things, that's also great cover for, look at what's happening to the infrastructure levels at Pearl Harbor. And at other facilities. So, if not Pearl Harbor, where else? Now, this is, of course, the Shameless Book Plug. Thank you to everyone who's buying the second edition. I have got some copies, or rather, when I say I've got some copies, they were delivered while we were in Cornwall. They're currently sitting in a neighbour's house. And believe it or not, between that neighbour's hours working as a gas safety man and my hours going backwards and forwards to hospital, we haven't managed to meet up for long enough for him to hand me those books back. So, I do apologise. Some are going out to people. There are a couple who I've got on the list of people I'd like to send them out. And I think if there's six in the box, then I will keep one for me. Three are going out, so two will be prizes for Christmas. I haven't got any ideas of what people would like, uh, what sort of competitions to run. I've been thinking about it, but honestly, I haven't had much time. So I will take any suggestions for what kind of prize you would like, uh, what kind, not sort of prize, what kind of competition you think I should run for those books. Um, I'm tempted to do one of them be a design competition, and I could talk through the various designs and analyse which one I think is best, but I'm not sure what to make it and what specifications to put in, whether to go for uh, a, a treaty battleship uh, instead of nail rods, uh, nail rods or something like that, of what you think would be a good idea for me to do, uh, a good idea for the Royal Navy. I would love suggestions, okay? I'd love suggestions. 
And I know it's shamelessly using my own book as a prize, but it seems like a nice thing to do. Sideshow, skip forward one step, please. Thank you. That's what you have to consider why Pearl Harbor was chosen in the first place. Pearl Harbor is, of course, a major base. A major facility for the U.S. Navy, for the U.S. Army. It's the hub of America's Pacific power projection. It's also national territory, which means it's going to have an emotional significance to the Americans. So it's got strategic military significance, it's got strategic emotional significance, and finally, its defences are atrocious. <laughs> they really are, okay? Look, in the nicest way, there, there are people often talk about, oh, well, if the radar had been left on for a little bit longer, they don't know. The fact is that the standing orders for the radar were to shut down, and the radar was only in there recently, and... It was a portable radar which had been set up. They didn't have fixed installations. They don't have anything like chain home there. This is your critical piece of national infrastructure. Sitting in a critical area and you haven't set up an actual proper radar defense when you've got radar for your aircraft to operate on. You haven't got fighters already distributed. Well, you've got some fighters distributed to um, various sort of extra airfields, but... They aren't really being supported. They, those those bases should have been stood up and should have been ma crewed and should have had aircraft at them far more than pairs of aircraft at them from the get-go, from the moment they were reaching the high-risk scenario. And we're going to talk about what I call as not negotiations, okay? Uh, people often talk about the American and Japanese having negotiations, and I realized in the live I didn't quickly uh, probably explain this because people said they are having negotiations, and I go, well, they're not really. And the reason I would say, and we'll get into this, is they're not proper negotiations, is because if you look at it, from the beginning, the Americans have a we want everything approach, and the Japanese have a we want everything approach, and neither side are actually ever conceding anything. They're, they, they, they're constantly talking around the edges, but at no point are they actually conceding anything. And the Americans are prepared to let the Japanese have nothing, and the Japanese, for certain reasons, want everything. And that's not a negotiation. That's basically parading around spouting hot air at each other, smiling, exchanging drinks. Oh, yes, we're being so lovely. But neither side is giving in. And it's not so much giving in as a case of you've got to try and reach a cooperation. If I give an example. Currently, my family are in negotiations for moving house. We are in negotiations with a vendor. Never quite sure how well, they go, whether they're sort of negotiations or not, but they're going... And there's a constant there's a conversation going on of what price. We don't want to pay what they're asking. We don't think it's worth that. And we've got to do modifications if we go in there. They, of course, would like what they're asking. But they realise that pretty much in a moment, and in fact, I'm fairly certain, we're the only ones who are putting any bids in. So in terms of they've got to move towards us and we've got to move towards them. We are not going to pay what they're asking. They are going to have to accept to lower what they're asking, or they're going to have to find someone else. Now, that's in a negotiation between individuals over purchase of a property. That's going to require give and take. America can't randomly find someone else to just take Japan's position, and Japan can't find someone else to take America's position. They can't do that. So they don't have the option of, Finding another buyer or finding another house to find, uh, finding another house to buy. They have to negotiate with each other, in which case they have to have preparation for what they're going to give in. And the trouble is for the Americans, is they have set up such a precedent of getting their entirely their own way and what they wanted that they presume they're going to keep getting what they wanted, but they don't realise that every time they've got everything they've wanted, they've built up a very bad reflection taste in the mouth of the Japanese in a sort of phrase of they don't they're not happy with it and this has set a bad precedent now in this scenario Pearl Harbor which is your critical base in your critical position in many ways is due to become even more critical because America was winding down its position in the Philippines etc winding itself away from the Philippines so Pearl Harbor is going to jump up even more significance 
If you consider the efforts they've gone to building almost fake battleships in in Manila to protect Manila, uh, Manila and other places from attacks, you then look at what they're doing for Pearl Harbor and you go, you're relying on distance and you're hoping that no one can reach you. Distance is just a factor of fuel. Okay, that it's it's complicated to refuel at sea and all these things. True, but it's just a factor of fuel. If someone is prepared to expend the fuel, then they can conquer the distance. So look at how Pearl Harbor was carried out. Well, for starters, Japan doesn't do necessarily a direct route. We are talking, we are talking in terms of ranges and I always like having my lovely Excel spreadsheet come up here. Roughly 3,400 nautical miles, roughly. They actually go a route which is roughly 4,000 nautical miles. The Falklands War, the British and the Royal Navy are projecting a war over 7,000 nautical miles. That's roughly 8,100 miles, but 7,000 nautical miles. What point am I making by including the Hawkins War here? Well, because you can do this. It's a core, a core thing of a having a blue water navy is being able to protect your power over vast distances. The Japanese navy, you consider the treaty system, Britain and America are theoretically joint first. We all know, thanks to the US Senate, that's not the case. Sadly, the, the, the Americans could have been joint first, but with the US Senate, it's more like uh, one's in first and one's at 1.2. The Japanese are, under treaty system, the second-ranked navy in the world, therefore. They had a second-ranked navy. They are the second most powerful navy in the world. You're assuming they can't do a long-range strike? You're assuming their ability is limited to the focus on the Philippines? That's a, that's a hefty, hefty decision to make. Now... Pearl Harbor is carried out, they do the, they're doing the strike, they're carrying out, prepared to carry out multiple waves of strikes. And this is where you get a big problem, because when we start to sort of talk through Pearl Harbor and its whole decision of where to strike, whether to strike, whether to do the third strike, the third wave, first wave goes in, second wave goes in, well, do you send the third wave, do you send more, these things... You have to consider the strategy behind why it was carried on. Why are they doing a long-range strike on Pearl Harbor in the first place? What is so? What is not in terms of the strategic value of them? What is it serving in terms of their strategic focus? What are they thinking about when they do it? So this is where Japanese doctrine comes in, and Japanese doctrine is fun because. Whenever I start talking about Japanese doctrine, I can tell you what people spend a lot of their time talking about. They will go, Kentai Kesen! And I'll go, yes, the decisive battle doctrine. And I'll go, Japan was focused entirely on that. And I'll go, do you know any other names for any other Japanese doctrines? No, only Kentai Kesen, so they must have been focused on that. And I'll look at them and go, okay, so I have some books for you to go and read. Lots of them. I am going to summarize a lot of books in this, but I have done a far better, far more in-depth video about Japanese strategy on my channel. There are several of them about Japanese doctrines and Japanese and the Kantai Kesen and all the things. I often have to bring it up and discuss it because almost every video, lovely, thank you very much, attracts new viewers. Thank you, I need new viewers. I need to grow the channel because I'm an evil historian. And I have a problem. I work for universities and they are interesting when it comes to paying you. <laughs> but YouTube, YouTube and Patreon, you are all very nice and very generous. And how do I put this? Actually understand 
pay dates and how bills come out on certain dates and pay needs to go in on certain dates so it works it's amazing for my bank balance to have the money coming in reliably on certain pay dates i love being a contract lighter it's fun anyway leaving that to one side the new viewers are great but the new viewers, new viewers don't always go back and watch those old videos so i'm going to summarize this but if you want to learn more please just Go around, my, look around my channel, uh, look for the Admirals and uh, th there's Admirals Command watch list and that has all those sort of strategy discussions in there. And that's basically me going through, that's the watch list I use to cover all strategy and dis discussions. Anyway, so it's a much more than just the Kantai Kessen. I wish it was just the Kantai Kessen. That would make my life a lot easier, a lot, lot easier. And honestly, when we start off talking about it, most people then sort of start bringing in, well, if they are do know anything else, they start bringing up the Japanese Imperial Defense Policy, uh, the Tekoko uh, Kokubo Hoshin, which is the Imperial Defense Policy. There's also the Tekoku Yohei Koryu, which is the Imperial Defense Doctrine. Those are two separate do documents. Those are two separate strands of... I would say interlocking, but also to an extent independent um, discussions. Now, the Japanese operational doctrine is often called Yohei Koryu. Now, that, if you might notice, I've just said Imperial Defense Doctrine is called Tekugu Yohei Koryu, and the operational doctrine is Yohei Koryu. Guess where one comes from? Now, and this is in every year goes into the operational plans, which are the Nendo Sakusen Kekako and uh, Keiko Kekako. I, my Japanese pronunciation is terrible. I do apologize. When I visit Japan, hopefully in a few years' time, it'll probably still be bad. But I will apologize to the Japanese in advance. They are very nice people in my all my experience when dealing with them, and they usually take someone try, uh, trying to do some Japanese in the spirit it's intended, which is, I'm trying. And then they respond in English and go, shall we just talk in this? And I go, thank you very much. Thank you. You're very kind. Anyway. Now, interesting enough, the Kantai Kesen, one reason why we're so focused on it is because the Japanese themselves write about it a lot. It's written into the Kokubara Sreyo Haikaro, uh, which is the military strength requirements for national defense. And that is the document which then feeds into the Imperial Defense Policy and Imperial Defense Doctrine, which I talked about earlier. The Tekoku Kokuba Hoshin and the Tekoku Yohei Koryo. Now, the fact you have those two documents, you have that one document feeding into it, it becomes a sort of circular triangle of information feeding into it. But. The fact is, it's a legacy of Toshima, the Decisive Battle Doctrine, and it's been a, it's a legacy of previous Japanese uh, ideas. If you can have a decisive battle, again, remember, we're talking in many ways Greeks versus Romans in terms of their diplomatic cultural approach to war. The Greek approach to war was to have a massive battle, and whoever won got to decide, uh, got to have leverage and primary control of peace negotiations. The Roman policy was to have a massive battle, and if they lost, come back with an even larger army, win the next time, and then take you over and dictate peace terms. If you consider what happens with Japan after the Russo-Japanese War, and if you consider their perception after their involvement in World War I, where they were involved far longer, and for far more, t uh, far longer, and in far more ways, in far more theatres than the Americans were. You can understand why they developed this idea that there will be a decisive, massive battle, and then there'll be a negotiation. And they had it from before with their previous history, because that's what you do when you're on a island and you have limited resources. Um, the exception to that one, as island culture seems to be the British culture which ends up going far more Roman. But in our defense, we were at one point conquered by the Romans, so we might well have learned from them. There was a significant Romano British culture for a long time, which then the Anglo-Saxons fed into, 
then the Vikings arrived, and eventually we had the Vikings who'd settled in northern France arrive, and um, yeah, interesting relations ever since. Now, whilst I would say, and I would argue strongly, that cruiser policy, especially heavy cruisers, are structured around the Cantor Kesson Doctrine in terms of their shipbuilding, it isn't locked in for their military operations. In fact, I would say that Pearl Harbor is something called Yogeki Sakusan, the ambush strategy, and Yogeki Sengen, the Sankusan, interception attrition operations. Now, this is a point which people sort of go, what do you mean? Well, basically, when we go talk to Yugeki Sengen Sankusen, the idea is that you get the US Asiatic fleet to charge across the Pacific to attrit it as it comes using submarines, long-range torpedo strikes, and naval aircraft. And then eventually, once you've attrited it down in numbers, you destroy it in a decisive battle. Once you've got numbers to a point at which they're roughly equal to. This is where things get interesting, because... Please listen to this one carefully. Because if you're going to do this, you have to be overriding logical command. Because if you're a naval commander of any wit, any fort, once you start losing enough forces, you're going to start. You're going to think you need to withdraw. Now, some people point out, well, you know, what you do is you hold off. You hold off a tritting them until they're close enough that you can, they can't withdraw. That's a good idea. But think about the sea and the way the sea works. You can do that in land because there can be land features which can make withdrawal very difficult. They can be across rivers. They can be the wrong side of mountain ranges. There's all sorts of things you can do. But the way sea works, as long as they have fuel, they can get away. Now, yes, you can chase them, but then you've got to expend full cha fuel chasing them and finding them. And the thing is, you're then going to be acting against your own interests because the whole point was to bring them in closer and then destroy them. So actually, what you have to do in naval attrition operations is lobster boiling. You have to turn up the temperature so slowly, so slowly, that they don't realize they're being boiled. So you have to start the attrition actually quite early. But also, you have to guarantee they're going to keep coming. And that's got to be a political decision. That's got to be overriding rules of engagement, instructions from a political figure, because even a naval officer who doesn't realize it till it's uh, almost too late will probably realize it before it's too late. And if you want a good example of that, we've got the rules of engagement of the German Navy in World War II. We've got all sorts of options which show where rules of engagement can actually factor against good naval strategic and operational thinking. So that means you've got to anger the politicians to make them give stupid orders. Now, I would argue that's where employing the ambush strategy, and I do love the ambush strategy, it's a core part of Japanese ideas, really, the Yogeki Sakusan, and it's one of the reasons why it's linked into the attrition, str attrition strategy, is that you attack the enemy in a way and a time where they don't believe you will attack them. Pearl Harbor should not have fallen into that category. Pearl Harbor shouldn't have. It does because of the arrogance of American, I would argue, American political leadership. 
People have often said that, you know, done various conspiracy theories about Roosevelt knowing war, knowing the Japanese are going to attack, knowing Pearl Harbor is going to happen. No, it's not. People are always ascribing it to malice when actually they should be ascribing it to stupidity and arrogance. He couldn't believe. He couldn't conceive of the Japanese doing that to attacking Pearl Harbor, attacking the American soil, American fleet. Why would they do that? That would be so stupid to do. They can't do that. Don't they know they're going to lose? It's not, it's not any conspiracy theory. Conspiracy theories require brains and effort. Stupidity requires nothing. Never ascribe to malice that which you can put down to stupidity and laziness. Because 99 times, no, 999,999 times out of a million, it's going to be laziness and stupidity. I'm sorry, my... My belief in humanity is not so high to ascribe it to malice. Just not. And that's the point. The whole idea is to force the Americans to do something stupid. Now, this feeds into decisive battle, but also it feeds into an idea, which you think about it, if the Americans do this, what, you know, what are the Americans going to do? They're going to rebuild the fleet and come back again. The Americans are Romans in their sort of view of warfare. If you want to prove that, look at the American Civil War. Look at the American War of Independence. Look at the Americans rebuild themselves and come back and fight many, many times. The same in the British. It's an annoying part of them. They have infrastructure. They're willing to use it. They have populations. They're willing to chuck them away. For a point of principle, sometimes. And the populations are perfectly willing to do it for a point in principle because they are just that level of stubborn. Okay? It's just... it. No one's quite sure where it comes from, but they're just that level of stubborn. So what can we infer about their range of action targets here? Well, even though roughly 3,500 nautical miles, when you look at the... Uh, the fact they do some dog legs and we all sorts of other joyous things to try and keep away if we look at this one and this is a very very simplistic map of and diagram of it judging by their actual maneuvers and rate of progress 4,000 nautical miles would be your rough rough strike range they're going to roughly be striking 4,000 nautical miles and they're using a carry strike to lure the enemy out and they're looking for an emotional reaction from the political class of the country Also, if they really do want to decisively sink things, they ideally don't want to sink them in harbour. They want to sink them at sea. Because if you sink it in harbour, the enemy can recover it. It's annoying that they can. It's just what they can do. Also, if we consider the actual capability of Japanese aerial torpedoes in harbour, and the Japanese knew this, they didn't know why the British were theoretically so successful, but there is a reason why Japanese and German estimates of the British attack on Taranto refused to believe it was a solo carrier operation due to the number of torpedoes that hit. They believed the British were lying. Which is actually a really interesting thing, because where, where is the other carrier? What is the other carrier that's doing this? Carrying out uh, involved in this strike? Do they think it's Ark Royal? But she was doing strikes elsewhere at the same time. Do they think it's Eagle? And the British were lying about Eagle, but she's fairly easy to work out. They've got agents working. So where do they think this extra carrier is coming from? But can see in their, their intelligence operations cannot conceive that it was so successful using a single carrier load of aircraft. Because of their own ability to launch torpedo, uh, to dr airdrop torpedoes. Later on, they go to the scenario the British must have some sort of secret methodology which makes their torpedoes fly better through the air. And no point does anyone consider it's a simple tension wire. <laughs> and that's all. The British basically just went, right then, fins work, but they don't work that well. Okay, that's a tension wire. Okay, we'll try that. And it just as a reel that comes down and boom. And it's thanks to it being swordfish as a biplane, you can do that with that. 
with the whole, the whole system, the way it's flying and, you know, the speed and movement, you can do the tension wire approach. It's one of the reasons why the Swordfish, despite looking, especially to the eyes of the people when they're talking about aircraft which entered war in 1941, for powers who entered the war in 1941, looks very old-fashioned. But in 1939, it's very high-tech. Now, the non-negotiation negotiations. Oh, this is some fun. And... Well, uh, they, these have been going on for months, but the whole time they're not really changing their positions. And I have fun because every time the document, uh, you know, I get I get into my various works and I'm sort of doing these things, uh, there's a whole debate in Microsoft Word as to whether it's American or British English. I'm not sure why. Every time I try and st change its uh, its system to just go go with British English, they try and auto correct me to American English. And if I go right now, I'll just give up and I'll just write in American English. They get annoyed and they write and they make me. Uh, they go, oh, you you should be taught doing this in, in British English. And it's a case of, I hate you, Microsoft Office. I really do. But leaving that all to one side, negotiations. Japan wants to honour its alliance to Germany and Italy in the tripartite pack in terms of trade. Now, why do they want to do this? Well, they're getting access to a lot of information, a lot of intelligence from the war effort. They're getting access to a lot of support in some ways. And honestly, the Americans aren't offering them much in return. Japan wanted economic control and responsibility for Southeast Asia as well as envisioned in the Greater East Asia co-prosperity co sphere. Basically, they wanted to have dominion over Asia. Not necessarily colonize it formally, although I could see them having that, but they would take that as the primary position. And they don't want to leave mainland China unless they manage to keep the state of Manchukuo. And Japan's pretty much consistent the whole way through of the wanting these three things. Uh, the 26th of November Hull note from Secretary of State Cordell Hull was this. Um, inviability of territorial integrity and sovereignty of each and all nations. Uh, non-interference in the internal affairs of other countries, equality, including equality of commercial opportunity and treatment, reliance upon international operation and cooperation and conciliation for prevention of Pacific settlement of controversies. All sounds lovely until you sort of think about the commercial opportunity and treatment. Now, if you consider America's relatively a relative economic power versus Japan's, if Japan's not able to protect itself economically in some ways, then the, this period, American econ economics could wreck Japan and make them basically a subordinate nation. Because Japan hasn't developed as much as it, as well, with focusing itself on the military power and growth of empire, its civilian economy isn't anywhere near where it should be. It's one of the reasons why they have trouble paying for things. Non-discrimination in international commercial relations. Oh, feed them the same things. Uh, Non-discriminatory access by all nations to raw material supplies. Full protection of the interests of consuming countries and pro uh, populations in regards to the operation of international community commodity agreements. And establishment of such institutions and arrangements of international finance. Now, I would say here's the problem. In that section, America is talking finance. Japan isn't. Why do they want contr economic control responsibility for Southeast Asia? It's not for financial reasons. Honestly, they're a government run by admirals and generals. They're not worried about economics. They don't really understand them. What they worry about is supplies and raw materials. And whilst that theoretically has it, you have to remember, Japan, if you can describe as anything in terms of English-speaking world's economic theories, you would argue is mercantilist. They want to believe control is guarantee is the only way you can guarantee access to raw materials. Now, the second ten points, the second section of it, 
Steps to be taken by the governments of the United States and by the government of Japan. Specifically to support all those first ten points. And those first principles. It's, it always reminds me of kind of Wilson's. It's very high-minded. It's lovely. But it's very high-minded. Multilateral non-aggression pact among the British Empire, China, Japan, the Netherlands, the Soviet Union, Thailand, and the United States. That's interesting, because the Netherlands at this point are occupied as the free Netherlands, but Netherlands themselves, strictly speaking, are occupied at this point. The Soviet Union, okay, Thailand, fine. China, mm, that could be interesting, getting them and Japan to agree a non-aggression pact at this point, because, well, you then see how it works, because pledge itself to respect the territorial integrity of French into China. Okay, so you're not allowed that either. Withdrawal of all military and naval air and police forces from China and from Indochina. Um, okay. No support, military, politically, economically, of any government or regime in China other than the national government of the Republic of China. I think that's going to cause trouble for Manchukuo. Manchuko. Uh, both governments given up uh, to give up all extraterritorial rights in China. Entering negotiations for conclusion between the United States and Japan of a trade agreement based upon reciprocal most favoured nations treatment. Remove the freezing restrictions on Japanese funds in the United States and American funds in Japan. Agree upon a plan for the stabilisation of the dollar yen rate. No agreement with any third powers to conflict with the fundamental purpose of this agreement. Influence other governments to, to adhere to the basic political and economic principles in this agreement. So basically, Japan's being told to give up on everything it has in China in return for entering into negotiations for the conclusion between the United States and Japan of a trade agreement based upon reciprocal most favoured nation treatment. Not that it actually to be concluded and agreed. No, for for negotiations for the conclusion. So basically, America is asking for something very solid. Withdrawal of troops, withdrawal of personnel, surrender of these territories, surrender of all this stuff you've gained and you've, you've expended political capital to secure, and people to secure, blood and treasure to secure, and in return, we're going to negotiate about something that could be economically beneficial to you. See what I mean? Japan is asking for it all, which America is never going to give. And America is asking for it all, which Japan is never going to give. And they've been, nego they've been theoretically negotiating for months at this point. To try and better improve relations between Japan and America. And your positions are still right back at the beginning from where they are again. And your promises are, we promise to negotiate for something. We, it's not even promise of gold later. It's promise to negotiate for potentially gold later. Neither side is really going into these negotiations or realistically understanding of each other. Because America's never going to give Japan all that. They will probably allow them to honour their agreements with Germany and Italy as long as they don't join a war. Um, they won't allow them economic control and responsibility for the Southeast Asia because that basically is, Kane was, uh, basically is the same as signing over Southeast Asia to them. Um, frankly... America, theoretically, it, this is going to sound terrible, the only thing which America might have conceded on, and which might have been enough for Japan to actually agree to, is if they let Japan keep the state of Manchukuo. And then you could have whittled down Japan's position to just they keep that, but they get out the rest of China. And China might not agree to that, but at a certain point, America is financing the Chinese government and all sorts of things and they have all sorts of internal issues and it's just a case of this stops the war.
This stops the war. That's it. But America wants it all, and Japan wants it all. And so, it all, nothing happens. It's just, it's not negotiations. It's just pointless posturing and smiling at each other and going, Hey, I'll be friends. Mm. So what are the other options? What are the other options? San Francisco, California, which is the longest range of them all. It is, really is a long range. It would be roughly a 6,000 nautical mile route to, to take to get to and hit a strike at San Francisco. But it's not an impossible route. And for that, I would say you would reduce the force to roughly two carriers to launch a strike. We'll talk about them more. Anchorage, Alaska, which is closer than Hawaii is. It's 3,100 nautical miles. So if you're taking a circuitous route, it's theoretically 3,500 nautical miles. But honestly, you probably still thread the needle like you do with uh, threading between Aleutian Islands and Middle. And Midway, because if you're doing that, it makes sense. Singapore, uh, Philippines, of course. Attacking the Philippines is an obvious one, but we all know that General MacArthur's in charge there. And we know how his command structure actually falls apart, and also how well the Japanese attack on the Philippines goes when they originally do it. If they did it earlier on as their opening move, that could have been really embarrassing to the Americans, especially if it was combined Army-Navy operation. Uh, such a formation, such an effort would possibly, in fact, quite probably cause a number of interesting reactions. But it would be a lot harder to keep hidden. Not impossible. Really not impossible to keep in, considering what else they have going on there. There are many reasons for the Japanese to be forming up forces aboard ships. They would probably presume they'd be attacking spaces in China. They could be presuming they're reinforcing Indochina. There's all sorts of reasons they could be doing it and forming up groups together. Carriers were used quite a lot to support operations in China. So it's actually disturbingly easy for the Japanese to put a massive force into Taiwan area and be able to justify it without the Americans being able to go, you are provoking us or threatening us. Singapore. Singapore is possibly the most difficult to actually get to without being spotted coming. And the British are on alert level. But the thing is, it's still Singapore. Hasn't got much there. And if you're sending your whole force down there, you can cause a lot of damage. And Brunei, that's a kip, uh, that's a, a critical area they want to go for. Brunei has a lot of oil at. If they use, uh, they attack Singapore and invade Brunei, they can claim they're just joining the war against the British, joining their allies. At which point, you can cause all sorts of issues. Sydney, Australia. Similar factoring. Um, it would cause a massive amount of trouble for the British. And to not attack. And I'll get into all these in the various points and why we're talking them through. As the options. San Francisco, California. There is major. There are major naval bases there. There's Hunter's Point. There's all sorts of things there. You have to remember, it's where the Pacific Fleet used to be based before it was moved to Pearl Harbor. And it wasn't really moved to Pearl Harbor because, as I said before, they've consistently not funded the infrastructure and security built there. In fact, the infrastructure and systems which actually support the Pacific Fleet are arguably far more concentrated in San Francisco and the San Francisco area. In fact, attacking there is going to cause far more damage to the Americans. Also, it's a smaller force you'd be sending out, so it's a lower risk of discovery in some regards. But, here's the big point. You would be attacking a core part of America's home. Just think about the political reaction for a moment to attacking San Francisco.
Imagine the American reaction of their fleets, what they would be doing. They'd be ordering them out. They'd be ordering the fleet at Pearl Harbor to all go to sea to track down this force that's trying to get home, for starters. Oh, goody, you can bring uh, begin attrition operations the moment they've gone out to sea. They're going to come storming out to try and track them down. You could even have forces waiting oh, not far from Pearl Harbor for those fleets to get to sea to strike them when they get to sea. And remember, if you sink a ship in harbour, it can be refloated and fixed. If you sink a ship in the open ocean, usually goes down deep enough, refloating and fixing is going to be very difficult. Also, you're going to end up taking out a lot more crew. Which means you could turn Pearl Harbour into a decisive battle in that scenario. But that would require a lot more fuel to be expended on the operation, which would limit other operations, but it would would potentially cause such a great, uh, so much a greater loss than the American, so you might actually extend the time at which you have to rebuild your forces and restructure and secure territories and expansion for longer. It also might keep the emotional response running long enough that it's not just the first fleet which gets wiped out but in such an operation but the americans might fall for might charge headlong into the next one as well believing that it was only due to underhand tactics they lost and surprise not thinking hang on charging in there all guns blazing without thinking about logistics and without thinking about distances is going to cause you trouble alaska anchorage it's undefended. Come on, the Aleutians are proof that the Americans just don't have enough troops to cover all their territory. And they don't have enough forces. They haven't been investing enough to cover their territory. If you go and attack there, you could actually send less. I've put, when I talked about it, you know, you could send six carriers there. You don't need to send six carriers there. You could send two carriers and some troops and land them. And the population in Alaska is spread out. Yeah, they might have arms. Yes, you might be sort of dealing with people who would want to form irregular forces, etc. But the thing is, they can't really move. The great big Alaskan highway that's built is built in World War II. It's not there at this point. So you go and attack it now. There is nothing there. There is nothing to stop you. And let's be honest, that's going to be embarrassing. This is just not going to wound national pride, it's going to embarrass the nation. You know, you attack San Francisco, that's going to horrify the nation. It's going to cause a massive national security panic about the safety of America. You attack Alaska, you're going to cause a similar level of panic, but also people are going to look at, you, look at the government and go, what have we been spending our money on? Well, we've been barely spending any of your money, so we could keep taxes low. Yes, but what have you been spending our money on? Because we aren't able to defend our own territory. It's going to cause trouble. Basically, the, both of these first two options are great for causing a huge amount of political trouble in America, especially with midterms coming up. The odds are Roosevelt ends up with very much an opposition, even if people of the same party are elected, an opposition Senate and House, which are basically treating and blaming everything on his administration and none of it on their predecessors and what they've been doing. Because that's what they always do. It would cause all sorts of infighting and might actually cause issues with running the war, uh, running the war effort. Then we have the Philippines. There's a problem with attacking this and expecting an emotional response. The Philippines is a possession. It's not part of them. It's something the Americans like to have, like to lord it over, but don't don't isn't part of them. And honestly, whilst crippling the forces in the Philippines and taking them out, 
would be advantageous. They do that anyway quite quickly later on in World War II. But if you're using it as your first strike, you're actually going to have to pull your punches for your landing forces. Let me explain why. If you want to get the Americans to have to charge across the ocean to reinforce you, you're going to have to give them a reason, well, not reinforce you, to attack you and to try and reinforce the Philippines. You're going to have to give them a reason to do so. If you win and wipe out the American forces on the Philippines, which you can quite easily and quite quickly do with the sheer amount of firepower, if you combine for, that would launch the Philippines and the firepower that was launched in Hawaii, if you combine that level of firepower together, that is going to be an overwhelming amount of firepower. Especially when we consider the, the American command structure in the Philippines. If you do all that, you are going to have to quite specifically pull your punches so that some American forces are left standing and besieged. Preferably Manila. Okay? You're going to have to come with a functioning reason for why you have failed to take Manila. That at least provides cover, because you're going to want the Americans to want to charge across the ocean into your traps... So you can destroy them. Now, when you think about the whole Pearl Harbor attack, think about the issue there. This is a classic example of where this can go wrong. Because in Pearl Harbor, if they want, uh, if the idea is to get the Americans to charge across the ocean, you need to attack Pearl Harbor, but you need to do not so much damage that they can't char that they can't charge across the ocean. And that's trouble. They do so much damage to the battle fleet, the Americans can't charge across the ocean. They have to take time. And that time allows for cooler heads to prevail. That time allows for things to be sorted out. The very reason why Keeble, when he's actually preparing a response to send the fleet out to sortie to attack Japanese forces, is basically relieved of command for being a for doing this is because they don't the politicians are so stunned by the level of losses they don't think they have enough forces to do it. Keeble knows they can. And he knows the way he's gonna do it. He's a hard charging aggressive admiral, but he's not stupid. But the thing is they've lost so much forces in the attack. So much forces have been damaged that the American government and the politicians are feeling scared. And besides, they want a reason that they want to replace Keeble and Nimitz because Roosevelt, Nimitz was always Roosevelt's first choice. But Nimitz didn't want the poison chalice that was Pearl Harbor. He didn't want the Pacific Fleet Command. He knew the way it was being run, and he knew looking at Pearl Harbor, it was a poison chalice, and it was going to get hit. Let's be honest. This is what he might not write it down, but every admiral who seems to turn our position has the same theory going on in their head. You are putting us in a very exposed position where we're going to get all the blame because you're going to put it on us, and none of the credit, no matter how we do it because you're not giving us the funding we need to defend it. So again, if they attack the Philippines, they've got to somehow pull their punches, and they've got to pull their punches and control the pulling of their punches. And you're not just talking about controlling how many aircraft you launch. The first wave might have been enough. The second wave for a second wave did uh, you know, ex increase the damage exponentially, and the third wave would have taken, it f taken even more. And I'd argue that's why Nagumo actually holds the third wave, because they're not going for a total destruction. They were trying to get the Americans to chase after them. To chase across the Pacific, and he already realised from the reports he's getting from the first wave coming back and therefore figuring out what the second wave might have done, that, hang on, we might have done too much damage here. We've, we, we've shot, we, we've overshot what we aim to do. Well, you know, it's why I often go, well, actually, if you want to make Pearl Harbor make sense in terms of the number of strikes and damage, level of damage you're doing, you actually have to launch the third and fourth waves, and you have to be landing troops. And then you're using Pearl Harbor as the center of your operations to do a Kantai Kess, and you're projecting all your fleet, as much of your forces as you can, out to Pearl Harbor, and you want to draw the Americans in there to have a decisive battle there. Far away from Japanese territory and far away from American territory. But that's a completely different doctrine and idea. Singapore. Singapore has the advantage of being British. Okay. 
It's often stated that you that what the Japanese wanted were Brunei and the Dutch East Indies. So don't attack the Americans. Say you're joining the war on the side of your Roman, uh, your Italian and German counterparts as part of the tripartite pact, and you are attacking the British. Take out part of Singapore. Attack it. Overwhelm it with your aircraft. Bomb it to. Mm. And I know this base is from this picture is from the bases from the 1950s, but it still doesn't matter. There's a massive base there. It's not that well defended, but there's a massive base there. Attack it. Destroy everything you can. When you've done that, attack the British territories. Just like you've done with French Indochina. Don't go and don't go and attack thing other things that are outside of that regime. And put the Americans in a bind, because the Americans then aren't being attacked. They're not being given a casus belli. You're getting Brunei. You might even go after the Dutch East Indies with the same agreement, saying, well, these are part of the free Dutch forces which are still fighting the ger fighting our allies. We've joined the war effort, so they're now our enemies. And now you make the Americans have to decide whether they're going to join a war. They have to vote to it. You've got fuel. The Americans are having an argument during midterm elections about whether or not to declare war to defend people who they're not allied with. It's going to cause issues. And that's the point of attacking Singapore, really. It's the same with Australia. It's the same policy, but actually it's even worse on the British. Because you attack Singapore, they expect Singapore to be attacked. You attack Sydney, Australia. You attack it. And what do you get? Well, in the nicest way, the Australians have already been worried about Japanese at Japan attacking them. They've already been worried... You know, the Japanese, uh, the Australians and the New Zealanders didn't want the Anglo-Japanese Treaty to end. It was the Canadians who wanted the Japanese Treaty, the Anglo-Japanese Treaty to end in the Dominion Conference because they saw it as something which was provoking the Americans, who were their strategic concern. Whereas for Australia and Japan, uh, Australia and New Zealand, Japan was their strategic concern, and having Japan on their side gave them extra security. Hey, the joys of real politic, even in the, within the, uh, the British Empire. So attacking Sydney, that's going to cause the British to have to move a lot of forces. It's going to cause problems for Britain in the Mediterranean, Britain in the Atlantic, and again, it's going to cause the same issues for the Americans. They go, unprovoked that. Well, technically, Japan is allied with Germany and Italy. Tripartite pack. They are honouring their alliance. They're honouring their agreement. They have been requested to join the war, and they've joined it. That sounds like a legitimate reason to do the attack. It sounds like a lot of issues. And again, the Americans have the job of deciding whether they get involved or not. And they have to have a cold start to a war. Whereas if the Japanese have attacked Australia, the British in rushing to defend the other uh, Australia, moving forces around, will be forced to move forces to defend Australia, and probably to Singapore and all those things, probably won't be able to defend Brunei and the Dutch East Indies, and that could buy them time. And the British will have to be focusing forces and working out what they're going to do. It's going to cause a massive amount of problems for the British. So let's consider the stats comparison of your targets. So we have San Francisco, 6,000 nautical miles, major hub, all sorts of cool things. But you can probably only get two carriers to go there, but it will cause a massive emotional reaction. Anchorage, Alaska, probably still going to cause a massive emotional reaction because it's American territory. This is American soil. Yeah, you can hear the politicians now. Sorry. If you don't like it, 
Look at your pol- uh, look at the politicians when they are talking about anything which has happened which upsets them. They literally go, "It's you know, it doesn't matter which country they are. They do the same thing. It's X country. It's our soil da, 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 that's been burned, been whatever the." F- and they will back themselves into an ideological corner quicker than anything, which requires a massive emotional response. And then your poor navy and our armed forces have to deliver upon it. <sighs> Philippines, American protectorate, going to be less of an emotional reaction, but still could be a re- uh, still could be a pretty significant emotional reaction. And as said, if you're clever about it, you leave enough forces there that cause some trouble. Uh, enough forces there that means that the Americans have to go and relieve them. And you know you've got MacArthur then on the radio every night going. We are the American forces in the Philippines. We are fighting for American honor. We are pre- fighting reserve. And we are currently besieged and surrounded. But we will not give in. We will hold out till the forces come to relieve us. We will hold out till the forces come to, re- you know, relieve us. And you can just imagine Roosevelt going, I don't want to send forces to relieve you. I, I, I don't because that's they're, they're, they're going into a trap. But I've got to because every night you're on the radio talking about we will hold out and uh, fierce Japanese artillery fire. And the Japanese all the right time are going, we're still hitting the same points? Yes. Just keep firing them with the artillery. Let's add some shells into the background of the broadcast so everyone's getting the hype. We want the Americans to come charging towards us. We want them to come charging towards us with orders to relieve Manila, relieve the Philippines uh, at all costs. We want them to do that. So just keep up the emotional pressure. It's a really, really evil and slightly dishonorable plan, which is why I'm fairly sure the Japanese wouldn't have done it. Um, Because for all their other things in wartime, that's not really their way on a strategic level. Units will do it, but strategic level, that doesn't seem to be how they like to operate. Possibly because they're operating in the God Emperor's name and they want to keep them to extent honorable. Although they do do some, I do agree they do something similar, but those usually originate on a on a unit level, not on a higher top down level. And then we have Singapore and Sydney. You know that that you could go for a full carrier strike, six carriers, and you could cause all sorts of damage. There's there's all sorts of basing facilities around Sydney, Australia. That's why you attack it later on. You attack it with submarines later on in war. And then of course it's going to Pearl Harbor. It's got the American soil. It's a major naval base. And if you consider, it's slightly further than... It's easier to get to than Singapore because you're not having to thread through the islands. It's probably easier to get to... It's longer range than the Philippines, but you're less likely to be dealing with heavy concentrated defensive firepower because at least the Americans are expecting attack in the Philippines, so they do have some form of defense data. Um, it's going to offer you more of a interesting things to uh, attack and damage than Alaska, shorter range than Sa- uh, San Francisco. And if we're being honest, Australia, I've got you know it's it's four thousand three hundred nautical miles from Tokyo, but uh, from well, from Japan, but it's two thousand nine hundred nautical miles from the Marshall Islands, which are part of the the Japanese protectorate in the south in you know South Seas protectorate. So. It's doable, but I would say if the moment you decide you're going to attack America, there is a reason Pearl Harbor comes up first. There is, however, one other option. And this fits with the whole Japanese declaration of war, because if you consider when the declaration of war is delivered late and all sorts of issues, it is the uh, it is an interesting document. To the American perspective, and especially Secretary of State Hull's perspective, it is a confounding of lies, and it speaks of things which would never be done because he's always acted honorably. The trouble is, Hull, I, I'm going to take this politely, Hull doesn't seem to understand sometimes the actions of his own government in what they're doing. He sees what the government is saying they're doing and interprets it with almost the American perspective of it's good, it's being said, we're saying we're doing it this way, we're doing it for this reason, so it's going to be taken as this reason. The Japanese don't necessarily... what the, the people who are receiving what you're saying don't necessarily take it the way you're doing it. Now, when I talked about to not attack, just declare war, people often then point out to me, go, well, hang on, Alex. Hang on. 
what about their needs for fuel what about all the other issues they have and i go yes they do have these things they do have a need for fuel they do have a need for uh, things that need to dig in the game and whilst there are other options they don't really see the other options well well they could do they could do um To not attack, just declare war. You see, if you don't attack, if you just declare war, you force the Americans into a whole political debate. But also, you then give a big problem for Britain and the other allies in, not in, in following on with American sanctions. Because if they take part in the sanctions... They're joining a side in the war. But you haven't declared war on them, and they're busy fighting a war against Germany and Italy. And therefore, supplying you with fuel, should they supply you with fuel or not? Because if the Dutch don't supply you with fuel, they're taking a side. And suddenly you have... You can go, well, you've taken the side of our opponents in this war. Now, they could declare themselves neutral, but then that means they can't support either America or you. Which is kind of a difficult position for the Dutch and the British to take, because, of course, at the moment, they're receiving support from the Americans for the war effort against Germany and Italy. It is a great way for causing a lot of people a lot of trouble. Now, what happens? See, my theory is, if this happened, the Americans would send... Either they would have to send reinforcement forces to the Philippines, etc. Which you could attack en route. Without going offensive, but you could use your focus your forces on attacking those. And then you could take the Philippines. Now, some people point out to the large concentration of bombers and other forces being put over in the Philippines. Very true. However, overlay those bombers' ranges from the Philippines with where there are targets for them to actually hit. As we've been over and just mentioned, the Philippines are roughly, roughly 1,700 nautical miles from Japan. The maximum strike range... Well, the maximum range for a B-17G is a thousand miles, or roughly eight hundred and let's be honest, eight hundred seventy nautical miles. Let's just go with eighteen hundred seventy nautical miles, and that's carrying six thousand pound bombs. Their flight range with that, with all those bombs, by the way, is 2,000 miles, or 1,750 nautical miles. Which, again, if we go back to this, means they they can definitely take the Philippines. They can uh, from the Philippines. They can hit Japan, just not much of Japan. The B-25, which is a far more common, in some regards, aircraft. Well. That strike range, and this is for the B-25H, is less. Their total flight range is a little over a thousand, uh, nearly 1,200 nautical miles. And so, yeah. You can, in theory, bomb Japan from there. But how much Japan you can bomb from there is a different thing. And, again, if you bomb from the Philippines, that's great, you're in range. How quickly will you run through the supplies of bombs you have in the Philippines, which you are preserving for the defence of the Philippines? Every bomb, a set of bombs you use to attack Japan, you don't have available for when Japan's attack on the Philippines comes. Or you have to resupply. In which case, ammunition convoys and supply convoys have to be coming across. 
uh, across the Pacific, and they're going to have to be escorted because they're going to have to run through the South Seas territories. Or they're going to have to go a very southerly route through the US territories. Either way, it's not really good for them. They're going to need to be heavily escorted because they could run into the Congos. They could run into carriers. And that will allow you to attrit American forces. It's not a major fleet battle, but you can attrit them by keep saying convoy supplies to the Philippines and to other territories of theirs. And I said they can also go through the British Island. Well, they could go through the British Island chain now. Well, the British protected sort of Iron Chain and Australia sort of New Zealand Iron Chain sort of thing. But either way, it's just. It's not good. And again, if they go through that and the British support them anyway, the British are no longer neutral. In which case, the British are now fighting Japan. And that's something the British would prefer not to be doing, considering they're fighting Germany and Italy at this time. And they'd rather not have to spread their forces three ways. Not until they're prepared. It's just... It's an absolute dilemma. An absolute dilemma. So, yeah. Overall, Pearl Harbor is the obvious place to attack. But it's not necessarily the best strategy. And the trouble is with attacking it is they kind of attacked with too much. A six-carrier raid launching their carriers... They were expecting Pearl Harbor to be better defended than it was. They didn't believe the Americans were as undefended as they were. They expected them to put up more resistance than they did. They didn't. The Americans did have put up resistance, but let's be honest, the Americans weren't prepared. And the Japanese were expecting their attacks. They weren't expecting it to have the damage it did have, because, as I said, that undermined the entire idea of the Americans coming charging out across the Pacific. Now... The thing is, whether you ever think that's really possible, because if you look at War Plan Orange, and the American War Plans are all colour-coded, it's beautiful fun. War Plan Red is the one against the British Empire. Orange is against Japan. If they'd followed it, they could have what they could have done really well. Because War Plan Orange is actually a far more gratiated approach across the Pacific than what the Japanese needed. The Japanese needed the Americans to come charging across. And I think myself, again, you have another problem with the Hawaii versus San Francisco or Anchorage in this country. Because is Hawaii regarded the same way in this period as San Francisco be? No. I think if you want to get the Americans to charge across the Pacific, you've got to go for San Francisco. I can see why the Japanese went for Pearl Harbor. It makes a lot of sense, and it looks to them just as valuable. But I think San Francisco is the key one to attack on that one front. I don't think, though, necessarily this was the best strategic decision. I think the Japanese got locked into the idea of attacking the Americans. I am undecided as to whether attacking... Australia, or doing the declaring war and then doing nothing approach is best. One puts a, the onus on the Americans to declare war and the Americans to get involved, when so far the Americans have been trying to keep out of the European war, but are very keen on Pacific war, but if you don't have an actual Casa Spella, it's very difficult to get the American population sufficiently motivated for actually getting involved in such a war. Especially if you protest, uh, pr if I was the Japanese, I would launch a strike and then I would certainly go, look, we've joined our tripartite pact in this war, we are fighting this war, so therefore this, but we will concede other things to you. And present an agreement on the same morning as you're doing, launching the attack that way and just really put them into and publish it in newspapers. Publish the proposals you're offering in newspapers. I don't think the Japanese would do that, because that's not necessarily the way they think about it, things, but at this time period, in terms of their leadership. But, 
it's an option. Pearl Harbor is chosen because it fits their criteria, theoretically the best. Apart from, again, the thing is, you destroy that fleet. And this is the other advantage of hitting San Francisco. A, you'd be sending fewer aircraft, and B, fewer carriers, and therefore fewer aircraft. B, you'd cause a massive scare over America to defend itself, but also there's no chance of you actually doing so much damage the Americans can't do the emotional reaction. Anyway, so... So, today's question. Now, we've got this as an opening move in the Japanese declaration of war in World War II. Fact is, they don't actually write their declaration of war till after they've seen the attacks being a success. We'll leave that to one side. But it's not the only time it's happened. And with that in mind, I'd like you to think about what other surprise attacks so many of war you know about. I'd like you to think about, perhaps if you'd like, what other options, what other targets those armies and navies could have chosen for their surprise attacks. Would it have been better? What other options did they consider? Because, let me assure you on this, you do not make a decision like this to do this strike if you don't consider other options. So I can assure you, Japan did work through other options. They didn't just light on Pearl Harbor and go, that's the only solution. They did look at other options. They did look at work for other plans. To do, to do any way out, any otherwise would be complete negligence and completely stupid as well. And the Japanese weren't either of those. They were diligent and they were fairly, fairly smart operators. Even though I do think they made the wrong choice, I can see how they, their logic led them to that. Anyway, the year of technology is currently run most of its course other than the Christmas specials coming through. And what we have coming up, we have how will warship autoloader tunnels prototyped a development history, which is going to be tomorrow. Um, as long as I don't have anything sudden to deal with, like my mom coming out of the hospital. If so, there's going to be I'm going to record some ship, um, some key ships to as backing up tonight. I've got them all written up to it yeah, last night after I came home from the hospital, so I'll get them recorded after I come back from the hospital tonight. Thank you very much, everyone. Take care, everyone. And um, thank you again for all your message of support. It's been really, really heartwarming. Thank you, and take care.